Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. Thank you for all that you accomplished through it this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you messages on end time prophetic revelation on many different subjects for some time. And we're tonight, today we're going to continue. We started this morning talking about end time prophetic revelation in Job. There's a tremendous amount of revelation. We're just going to go over the basic principles. I see many, several here that are, were not here this morning. And so we want to catch you up on what we have talked about. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect, upright, one that feared God, and eschewed evil, which means to turn aside from evil. His name being Job, we got to understand that when you put the cursor over the word Job, look what his name means. His name means hated, one who is hated. And why is that? Because he is a type of the righteous church. He is a type of the righteous believer. And this is also a type of the end time perfected church that is going to come through victorious, the ones that go on to perfection, while the rest of them are going to be under the judgment if they don't walk right. Because Job, the, the, we see in the book of Job, it is a revelation of the judgment that's coming to the church in the last days, as well as a revelation coming to the world in the day of the Lord, and of the wrath that's going to be poured out upon the nations, as well as the wrath of Satan coming to, against Christians and what's necessary for believers to be protected. We can be protected and delivered during the Great Tribulation time, as well as seeing this completed work of redemption by Jesus Christ. This is all in the book of Job. Hated. He's the hated one, and because he was hated, he's treated like an enemy, and it's a persecuted one. And this is speaking of what happens to the church. It says he was perfect, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. The word perfect refers to one as blameless or faultless, who has come to completion and perfection. This is all a type of the end time church that's growing up and coming to the place of being that perfected, glorious church who is walking in the way of the Lord uprightly with the fear of God and is going on to perfection. So Job is a type of the remnant church who is perfect, blameless, upright, fears God, and they're the perfect man that it speaks of in Ephesians chapter 4, that they come to the place of being the perfect man. We come to verse 2. There were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. So this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. The word men actually is the word bane, which means sons. He is of all the sons of the East. He was one of the sons of God line that followed the word of God. And so he was tremendously blessed by God. And so Job is the type here of the church that will be blessed who will follow the way of the Lord. He's blessed exceedingly. God wants to bless us. He's a type of this remnant church, of course, also hate, not only hated by the devil, but also ungodly men who would try to come against the church. Same time with all these riches, being blessed not only with physical riches, but also spiritual riches of Christ, that we grow up and come to the place of following the way of the Lord and come to perfection. We see in verse 4, His sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Now these are the ones who are the compromised church they're a type of. They're not walking in perfection. They're not walking in the fear of the Lord. They got compromise in their life, and they're walking in the ways of sin. Verse 5, It was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. We pointed out that even though he did this, this would have no effect for sanctifying his children. Why is that? And we pointed this out this morning, but we're going to point it out again and also be exposing false teachings that are out there. In Ezekiel chapter 18, 
verse 20. We see something important. This has a false teaching that's come forth out of this as well. People have not understood this clearly. It says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. People have read that portion of Scripture to conclude that you can't have inherited generational curses, thinking that the son can't bear the iniquity of the father, so how could I ever have any curses from my father? But they failed to understand. The word bear is a word which means to lift or to lift up or lift, lift something. It's not talking about carrying something. It's talking about lifting it. The son shall not lift the iniquity of the father. And then, of course, they never read the rest of it. It's a classic example of people taking a scripture out of context to make a doctrine that we can't have an inherited generational curse. I've had people all over the world bring this up to me. He says, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Now, wait a minute. Let's say this was talking about inherited generational effects. How do they work? They come from the father down to the children, don't they? Do they go upward from the child to the father? No. So how can we say this has anything to do with inherited generational iniquity curse? Because it's talking about the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father bear the iniquity of the son. It's not talking about it because it means to lift instead. And what's it saying? The son cannot lift, lift off the iniquity of the father Neither shall the father be able to lift off the iniquity of the son. Can I get rid of my father's sins? No. Can he get rid of my sins? No. I've got to deal with them myself. Look what it goes on and says. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Well, whatever anybody is doing is what they're going to have upon him. So could Job get rid of their wickedness? No. He's offering it up continually because he was in fear but it would do no good because, again, the righteousness of the righteous is upon him. And we even see, and we looked at this, but we're going to look just a couple of the scriptures we looked at in Ezekiel chapter 14. It testifies here about who got delivered in the times of a great affliction. Ezekiel 14, 14 says, Though these three men, Noah, he was in a time there when everything was, they were so wicked when everybody was destroyed but him. Daniel, he had ended up going to the Babylonian captivity because they were all wicked and evil and continued to rebel against God. And Job, in this situation here, when people were wicked all over the place, they were in it. And they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Otherwise, they couldn't deliver their children. They could only deliver their own souls. We see it spoken down here in verse 20 again. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Everybody's accountable for what they are doing. Nobody can get someone else out of their sins or their iniquities. No, they have to deal with the situation themselves. We come down to verse 22. He says, Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant, and these are the ones that are walking as the righteous, that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and they shall see their way and their doings, and shall be comforted concerning the evil that I brought upon Jerusalem, because judgment was going to come on them, even concerning all that I brought upon it. And again, he says, and they shall comfort you when they see your, their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it. God does not bring judgment without a cause. There's always a cause for it. He doesn't do things arbitrarily. He does things with a cause. And so what we must understand is that God is a just God. And he only does things when there's a cause. And of course, those who are walking right are not going to have any judgments come from God. He doesn't do things that are caused by, uh, without a cause for it. And we looked at many scriptures this morning, but we just might look at a couple of these tonight in Psalms to show you that God, of course, we see he doesn't do things without a cause, but this is also showing you how the enemies, though, will work regardless of whether there's a cause. In other words, God's judgments only come because there's a cause of sin. The enemy, Satan, does he have to have a cause to come at you? No, he's going to come at you whether there's a cause or not. 
Look what it says in Psalm 69, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause. Well, that's the devil and anybody that's walking in his ways. See, you have to see that this is a type of end time judgment because judgment is coming to the church first and it's also coming to the world. At the same time, Satan, who's going to be cast out of the heavenlies and all his evil spirits, are going to be wreaking great havoc during the tribulation period, and they are going to be coming against God's people. They're going to be coming against them. Well, they're going to hate us even without a cause. We even see in Psalms 119, verse 161, He says, princes, this means rulers or leaders, have persecuted me without a cause. Even rulers will persecute us without a cause. It'll come down the line, unfortunately. In fact, even enemies will chase after you. That's why you've, if you're walking in the ways of the Lord and you are using your authority and putting praying the word of God and seeing the angels be protecting you, you'll be protected. But if you don't have God's protection, the enemies could try to come after you. Lamentations 3.52. <coughs> My enemies chase me sore like a bird without cause. Everything the devil will do, he didn't have to have a cause. He's going to go after you anyway because he hates you. So what we've seen here is God only brings a judgment with a cause while Satan will bring a kind of attack against you regardless of whether there is a cause or not. Now, the thing we talked about this morning, we want to bring it up again, is that judgment is coming to the church before it comes to the world. Many people have not understood this, and they are going to be in trouble if they don't, because God is going to bring judgment to the church first. That's Revelation 2 and 3. The judgment to the world is after that. 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin. It starts at the house of God. That's the church. And if it first, first in time, begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, they're in trouble. And who are the ones that come through that are going to be the remnant that are going to be victorious? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Who are the righteous? the ones that are born again and doing the word of righteousness. And when it says scarcely, it's interesting, this word means with difficulty and not easily, because we must conquer temptations, we must conquer the attacks of the enemy, and we are able to do that through the word of God. But nonetheless, there'll be pressure. We go through much pressure to enter into the kingdom. So the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, when it says be saved, it shows this work being accomplished in us on an ongoing basis because this is a present tense verb, which means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So the way it would be translated is our being saved. And who's doing this work? God is as we do the word. The reason why it would be our being saved is because of the passive voice, because that means the subject, who are the righteous, are being acted upon by somebody else who is God when we do his word to accomplish this. So the ones that are the righteous are going to come through victorious. So God doesn't bring judgment without a cause, though remember this time of revelation when all these things, when Jesus comes to, to take back the authority over the earth, it's going to be his time of judgment. He came first to bring salvation. Next time he's coming with judgment to bring judgment upon the world and to take back the authority over the earth. Well, this is important to understand that the remnant church must walk in the ways of the Lord so they'll be protected because judgment will come. Many people thought, well, I thought there wouldn't be, wouldn't be any judgment coming whatsoever uh, upon any kind of Christians. They have not understood the truth. That's not so. If you're walking right, there won't be any judgment. But look what it says here in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, that's every bit, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, of human beings, whether you're born again or whether you're not born again. When the judgments come, 
It's going to come on whoever is walking in ungodliness or unrighteousness, which would be areas of sin. Notice it speaks of those who are holding, not holding the truth in unrighteousness. You don't hold the truth in unrighteousness. It really means to hold back or to hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Otherwise, they're not walking in the truth. They're walking in unrighteousness because they're walking in sin. Anybody that's walking in sin, judgments are going to come. What's the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. Judgments are going to come. It's going to be poured out in the end. Now, we also point to go back to Job chapter 1. So we're reviewing some of these things we talked about. It's so important to get a hold of. We saw in verse 5 what Job did continually. We come to verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The sons of God are those who follow God. They're the ones who are the line of Seth, and they're the ones who are following the way of the word. Noah was a son of God. Enoch was a son of God. These guys were following the word. And so he also was, Job was a son of God, following the way of the word. And they came to present themselves before the Lord. We pointed out that this means to present oneself, and it's because it's the hith pale stem. It means that you're to present yourself in some manner to be showing yourself before one, and that's, of course, before the Lord. Because when the judgment's coming, he's coming to see whether we're walking in the ways of the Lord. Remember, it comes to the church first to see, are we going to walk in the way of the Lord or not? If we're walking right, we won't have any negative judgments. Instead, we'll have blessings that will come upon us. But the ones who are walking contrary to the word, they are going to see judgments. Remember, there's a falling away that occurs, which is the apostasy, defection of truth, which is going to happen first. And these are the ones that are not walking in the way of the Lord. Now, there's been a teaching that has gone forth. We pointed out this morning. We're just going to just rough, 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 briefly cover it that the sons of God here are referring to fallen angels. This is a teaching that is widely spread because it says Bain, you see the word below, it's Bain in the Hebrew, Elohim. Bain, Elohim, that combination is only in a few places. And one of the places in Genesis chapter 6, which we'll look at in a moment again for those of you who weren't here. But here, Bain, Elohim, they are claiming is referring to angels, fallen angels. It's a lie. And they think that this is angels coming to present themselves before the Lord and Satan coming among them, thinking that this is talking about in heaven. It's total deception. It's totally wrong. And the reason why they have to say this is because of Genesis 6-2. And let's go over to Genesis, or 6-4 it is. But first of all, let's look in Genesis chapter 6. Verse 2, the sons of God, they're the ones that followed God, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, meaning they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all they chose. Now, wait a minute. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Why were they looking at the daughters of men? They should have been looking at the daughters of God who were following God. But they didn't look at the daughters of God. They looked at the daughters of men because they were all out for physical beauty, and that's all they cared about. And so they compromised the word of God, and the sons of God married the daughters of men, which was a mistake. And what happens? And they're going to turn their heart away from the Lord if they don't follow people that are walking after the way of the word. What a mistake. Well, everybody has said that the sons of God is referring to these fallen angels. And the reason they say that is because of verse 4. It says there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men that were of old men of renown. It is taught widely in the body of Christ by many ministries, ministers, that the sons of God is talking about fallen angels, and that they came into the daughters of men and produced these giants. That's the teaching. You've probably heard that type of teaching out there. Well, let's look at this for a minute. Read the beginning of the verse. There were giants in the earth in those days. That means the giants were already here. Well, they were here before it talks about the sons of God coming to the daughters of men. 
because it says, and also after that, which means afterwards or following apart, uh, following that, afterwards of time, when the sons of God came in or the daughters of men, well, that tells us something. The giants were here first, then the sons of God came into the daughters of men second. So that means the sons of God coming to the daughters of men didn't produce the giants. They were already here. Well, that sure puts a big hole in the teaching, doesn't it? It destroys it right there. Because they say the sons of God are the fallen angels, mating supposedly with the daughters of men and producing the giants. It's all a lie. Widely taught. It's false. First of all, what does it mean when it talks about the giants? It comes from, this is number 5303 going to Strong's Concordance. It comes from number 5307, and when I put the double curse on it, that brings up what it means. It's the word fall. That's why Young's translates it the fallen ones. There were fallen ones. Well, they say, see, that was talking about these fallen, these angels. No, it wasn't. It was talking about the ones who were no longer following God, the sons of God, were no longer following, following them. Instead, what would they hey, do? They turned away, and there were all these sons of men and daughters of men, and they were violent, and they were evil as ever, as if violence was so bad that God was going to destroy the whole group. Every imagination of men said it was terrible, evil. Well, that meant these guys had were the fallen ones. They'd fallen away from God. That's who it's talking about the men that had not followed him. Furthermore, I showed this this morning, but I'll show it again. We look at the cursor over this word uh, for giants. This T-W-O-T is the theological word book of the Old Testament that shows information that's very good. It's a very good research tool. And, and this is the number in that 1393A. We're going to look at that. This program has this on the inside of this, and we can show you this. 1393A. There's 1393, and here's 1393A, the, with the giants, or the Nephilim, which means fallen ones. If we look at this, these guys tell what really happened here. Whoops. If you look down here where it begins with actually, it says actually the translation, translation giants is supported mainly by the LXX, that is the Septuagint version, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done in the 2nd century BC, and may be quite misleading. Why is that? Because it wasn't what they translated things before. It was, came in the Septuagint. The word may be of unknown origin and mean heroes or fierce warriors, because that's what these giants were. They were fierce warriors. Remember the giants that are in the Bible? They were warriors, and they were always conquering everybody. The RSV, which is a Revised Standard Version, and the NIV, New, New International Version, transliteration of Nephilim and Safer may be correct in referring the noun to a race or nation, because the NIV, they translated in Genesis chapter 6 as angels, which is error. Now, the word sons is Bain. The word for God is Elohim. Does God mean what he says? Yes, he means what he says. He didn't say sons of God and mean angels. If he meant angels, he would have said angels. So how'd they come up with that one? because they thought it was fallen ones instead of looking at exactly what the text says, and that's a great mistake. Now, we must understand that the word for angels, Genesis chapter 16, verse 7, this is the first time it's used, first use, it's the word malak. Here it is, malak. And if you look under the mu mu usage of malak, notice down here, this usage part where it says it's 214 times it's used, 111 times angel, 98 messenger, sometimes it means messenger, ambassadors. It's never translated son. <clears throat> never. Never translated son. It's ridiculous. 
And if we went back to Genesis, chapter 6 and verse 4, and we put the cursor over the word sons, let's look at its usage. 4,906 times, 2,978 times translated son, children at time, old, first, man, young, child, stranger, people, some miscellaneous ones, but if you check them all out, it's never translated angel. And so they're going to change it. Are they faithful to the translation of what the word means? No. Total deception. It is a lie. You say, well, maybe in Job or maybe here they just, you know, for some reason maybe didn't know about the word angel for some reason. Did they not know about the word for angel in, in Job? They sure did. Here it is, Job 4.18. He put no trust in his servants and his angels, Malak, if you notice it below. So this is a big error. Ministers for centuries have done this. Translation, ever since when the Septuagint came out with it, that the sons of God were fallen angels. It is a lie, and it's to deceive the people from the truth. And what this means is going to Job in chapter 1, when we see this, they're thinking that the sons of God are the fallen angels just presenting themselves before the Lord, so they fail to realize that instead the sons of God were presenting themselves before the Lord because it's all pointing towards the judgment coming to the sons of God or the judgment coming to the church. It's a type of. They'll never figure it out because they changed it. We have tremendous error. It is not talking about the angels. In fact, if we go back, one other thing I'll just tell you about Genesis 6, 4. When it talks about the sons of God coming into the daughters of men, they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, strong and mighty, which were of old men. And what does it say? Men is the word Enosh, which means mortal man. Can angels reproduce? No. Could angels mate with women and produce something? No. They're in a totally different order. They can't do it. Do we ever see anybody, or anybody ever reported in history where an angel mated with a woman and we see someone that's a hybrid out there? I've been yet looking for, the, for those guys to produce a hybrid. Uh, they've never been able to produce one because there is no such thing. This is a lying teaching from the devil that has deceived the body of Christ. Many ministries talk about this, and they think that this is all talking about these fallen angels, even people in prophetic circles and different groups. It's a tremendous error that is wrong. So instead, what's really happening? God is having them present themselves, and we looked at the many scriptures, which we won't go back over today, but the many scriptures where he talks about how they presented um, the, them before the Lord. We ought to look at one, I guess, one that we looked at. So presenting them is because they're going to be examined to see whether they're right or not. They did this many times. We saw it in about seven, eight different scriptures this morning. We won't take the time to go through them again, but I want to show you this one. And this is one where it actually is prophetic of the judgment that's going to come on those who have not walked in the way of the Lord and rejected the way of the Lord. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 12. We pick up here in verse 13. He says, Now therefore behold the king whom you've chosen. Remember the Israelites? They didn't want the prophet ruling over them anymore. They wanted a king and be like all the nations. That was wrong. And whom you've desired, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. He let them choose what they wanted. He gave them what they wanted. And we come along here, and we see in verse 16, Now therefore stand, this is the word yatsab, which means, again, to present yourself, and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Otherwise, they're going to see a judgment coming upon them because of what they did. And this is prophetic of the end times because of what it says. Is, not, is it not wheat harvest today? You may not know too much about the harvest, but there is the barley harvest, which is at the first Hebrew month in the beginning of the year. And that speaks of the Jews. 
the wheat harvest, which is in the third month and following, is the time of Pentecost, which speaks of the church age. So, this is a type pointing towards the, it's talking about the wheat harvest in the church age. So that would be the judgment that's coming to those in the church age. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord and he shall send thunder and rain. Thunder and rain refers to judgments. That you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you've done in the sight of the Lord and asking you a king. So he called on the Lord and he sent the thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord. This is pointing now to the fact that the people who are not right with God will see a judgment. And talking about the wheat harvest points towards the time of the church age at the end. So the remnant church is going to be the one that's blameless, undefiled, upright, fearing God, turning from evil, while the ones that aren't walking right, uh, they're going to be under the judgment. Now, we'll go back to Job. And we come, we saw verse 6, verse 7. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered, and the Lord said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, we have to cover this for a moment, it's important. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect man, upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? It sounds like by just reading that, that he's saying, hey, I got this great guy out here. Have you looked at him? Kind of dangling him before him or presenting him before him. Hey, he's a, he's, this guy is a fears, perfect, upright man, fears God, and just turn away from evil. That's not what it's saying at all. How do you know? I put the word over the word, a curse over the word considered. There are two Hebrew words that are translated here, one English word in the King James, which is an error. Here's the first one. It's called, it's sum. And it really means to set. And then there's another one underneath it. The second Hebrew word is the word lab. The word lab means heart. It's been translated heart 508 times. And when you look at this in the Hebrew, what this is translated, what the saying is, hast thou set thy heart against my servant Job. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Well, that's a totally different understanding. Say, hey, have you considered this guy is a pretty good guy? No. God's calling Satan on the carpet here, saying, have you set your heart against my servant Job? And that was the truth. He was walking up and down because he'd set his heart against him. And this is all a type of the fact that the devil has going to set himself against those who are the true church that are walking in the way of the Lord because he wants to bring destruction against them. So, here we see that God, knowing what Satan was, of course, doing, calls him on the carpet, essentially, knowing that Satan's coming to try to bring destruction upon him. So, here he says, tells him this, and Lord, Jesus, or Satan answers the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for not, or for any no reason at all? Hast thou made a hedge about him, about his house, about all that he hath on every side, and you bless the work of his hands, and the substance is increased in the land? Here he's talking about a hedge being made. Well, that tells us something. A hedge of protection can be made. It be, can be made if we do what's necessary to make the hedge by doing what the Word says. It's not automatic. Not everybody has a hedge of protection. Only those that are hearing and doing the Word and praying and seeing it be built. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance increased. Well, who did that? God, of course. Well, that tells us that these things can happen for us and they're supposed to happen for us. The end time church, as well as the church throughout the ages, is to be blessed. He wants us to be blessed with a hedge of protection around us so the enemy can't get to us. Well, in verse 11, this is what then Satan says. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has, which would be all of his possessions, and he'll curse thee to thy face. He'll turn against thee. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get God to bring a judgment against Job. Why would he be doing that? Because he knew that the hedge was down and that Job had an area of sin that caused that hedge to be down. And he was trying to 
force or pressure God to make a judgment upon him. Put forth your hand and touch. The word touch actually means to strike, strike against. That's why Young's translates it correctly, to strike against all that he has. Otherwise, he's trying to tell God to go strike against him, which means why would God do that? Remember, he doesn't do anything without a cause. That means he'd be judging him for a sin, right? He'd be bringing a judgment upon him. Well, you bring a judgment upon him and he'll curse you to your face. He'll turn away from you. Well, was God, God, of course, what does this mean? Satan's commanding God to do this. That meant there was either one or two things that were happening. If the hedge of protection was up, that means God would have to take it down and then bring a curse against him and bring destruction against him and stuff. But how about if the, the hedge was already down? That meant the fact that that hedge that God had built, it wasn't there anymore. Why would something come down because of sin that opened up the door. When you sin, you give place to the enemy and the hedge won't be there anymore of protection. And that's the case. Of course, Satan knew that. And God, of course, is not going to take down any hedge, of course. The fact is, there are three, three choices. This hedge was already down. Was God going to take the hedge down? Nope. Could Satan just take the hedge down whenever he wants? No. Who would take the hedge down? Man takes the hedge down. He's the one that would break a hedge. In fact, we even see in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, He that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, the serpent shall bite him. You'd break the hedge because of sin. That'd give the open door for the enemy, giving place to the devil to be able to come in. So, the fact is that he, he knew that the hedge was down, and he's trying to get God to bring a judgment upon him because of his sin. Now, what was the sin that pulled the hedge down? Job 3, verse 25. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. Fear pulled down the hedge and was the open door so the enemy could come against him. No longer was this hedge being built. So, because of the fact that this hedge is down, and of course he's trying to get him to judge him. Now, God does things when only because there's a cause. Was he guilty of sinning against God? No, you're going to see this a little bit later. We want to show you this at this point. You'll see, understand it further. This is before the law. Job lived long before. Before the law came into being. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That means, when there was sin, everybody saw the effect of the sin because it has its effect, destruction of some sort. For until the law, sin was in the world, and its effects would have occurred, but sin was not imputed when there's no law. In other words, until the law came into being, the sin was not being charged against them on God's, from God's perspective until the law came. That doesn't mean there wasn't an effect. There was an effect because they saw all kinds of destruction. But because of that, that is why there'd be no reason for God to bring any kind of judgment against him. The fact that sin was open door was, allow, was the devil could go and come against him. And of course, you'll see in a moment, that's exactly what happened. But he was trying to get God to do it. But God, of course, wasn't going to fall for that. God only does things according to his word. Oops, um, Job, where are we going? We want to go to Job chapter 1, verse 11, verse 12. So, look what happened. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Is that giving permission? That's what people have said. Well, he must have given him permission to go ahead. No, the hedge was already down. 
He's just simply telling, he already knew that Satan knew that. Satan was trying to get him to judge him because the hedge was down because of his sin, and you should judge him. No, God doesn't judge them except there is a cause. And in that case, because the law wasn't enforced, there was any, no reason for him to bring judgment upon him. So, he says, all that he has is in thy power, because it was. Satan knew that as well. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Why was that? Because he never cursed God. So what happened? So Satan, who was walking around looking to who he could devour, went forth from the presence of the Lord, and what did he do? He began to bring destruction against all the things he had. The sons and the daughters were eating, and here the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding besides them, and all this destruction came. The Sabians fell upon them and took them all away and sl slew the servants as well. That meant a judgment came on those, and remember, these ones are the ones who weren't right, the sons and daughters who were compromised. They're a type of the church that's not walking right. They're going to get judged because the judgment's going to come. They won't be protected. And notice he says, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. That means somebody escaped, but all the rest of them got judged. We come to the next one. Here he says, the fire of God's fallen from heaven. Well, it's correctly uh, stated there that that was said, but it wasn't the truth because this is Satan coming against him, not God. It burned up the sheep, the servants consumed them, and I only am again am escaped alone to tell, tell thee. So, while he's speaking, another one comes in and says, The Chaldeans, here they fell upon the camels, carried them away, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Everybody's getting wiped out except for this one who seems to escape. And then we see another he talks about the sons and daughters were eating in their eldest brother's house. And a great wind comes, smote the four corners of the house, it fell, they're dead. And I am only, I am, am only am escaped alone to tell thee. Each case, there was a judgment that came because the hedge was down upon those that were in compromise and not walking right. Yet somebody escaped. And who would that be? That would be the few or the remnant or a type of the ones who are walking right with God. Will they be able to escape the attacks of the enemy? Yes. Can the righteous be victorious and not see the enemy prevail against them? Yes, because they will escape the attacks of the enemy as they walk in the ways of the Lord. And as you, you and I are walking in righteousness, remember Noah, Daniel, and Job they got delivered because of their righteousness in the midst of all the other things that were going on. So, where it talks about, I only am escaped alone to tell it four times, that is pointing towards the perfected, holy church that will escape the attacks of the enemy. Because there's going to be people that are going to make it through the end, remember, to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So that's a type of all that. So, it goes on. Job rose. He says in verse 21, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He says, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. It's truly stated, but is that a true statement? No. Who came and took away? It was the devil who was bringing the destruction. He didn't have revelation of the devil. And so he assumed, he thought this was God doing it, because he didn't know. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Why? Because he didn't have knowledge of it. He didn't know about Satan. He wasn't revealed at that point in time. He just assumed that it was God. Now, what people have thought was, they believed this is a truth. Well, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So they think that any bad stuff, that must be the Lord. He's taken these things away from me. And this is also where the sovereignty of God teaching that comes forth saying, God can do anything he wants, everything that happens, it's God's responsibility because he's sovereign and he's the one who takes, gives and takes away and he does everything, however he wants. We already saw, does God do things without a cause? No. He only does things in response to his word, doesn't he? In line with his word and with a cause. So, they believe this, and they've been deceived. God is a God who performs his word. 
He just doesn't arbitrarily do things. He just doesn't come and take away, you know, give one minute and then turn around and take away the next minute. That is a line teaching. And that is important to understand, especially to understand many scriptures uh, in the Word of God. There are places, by the way, where God did give something and then turn around and take it away. Why? Because there was a cause. There was a reason for it. Let's give, I'll give an example. Over in 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. He's talking about Saul, he was, who committed this. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected thee from being king. He made him king at one point, and now he takes it away from him. Why? Because there was a cause. He disobeyed. He rejected the word of the Lord. He didn't do what God commanded him to do. So therefore, that happens. This is also how you can understand the scriptures, God just doesn't arbitrarily do things. There's always a reason for it. People that think the sovereignty of God teaching that he's just, whatever happens, it's always God, you know. <laughs> it's not true. It's a lying teaching from the devil and to see people. So they don't even think that it could be the devil and they don't come against him. And they think it must all be God, so they submit to whatever happens. I'm not going to submit to something the devil does. No. Look what it says here. Romans 11, 22. Therefore, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. The Jews got cut off because of their rebellion and disobedience. And he says, now if you're continuing in his goodness, walking in his ways, you're going to be fine. But if you don't continue in it, now that meant you'd have a cause to get cut off. It could happen for anybody. This is also helping you to understand scriptures that apparently sound like God's just doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Here's an example, Hosea 6.1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Well, that gives you an idea about what it's talking about to begin with. They must have been with the Lord once and then they left the Lord and now they're talking about returning, coming back to him. That's repentance, isn't it? He hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. Well, did God just decide to tear them one time and then heal them another time? No. Why did they get torn and why did they get smitten? Because of judgment, because of a cause of rebellion and disobedience. Why did he come to the place of healing them and binding us up? Because they repented and they returned to the Lord. In other words, there is a reason for these things. They just don't, God just doesn't do things without a reason. There is always a reason. In fact, one scripture we ought to look at you got to understand, it's in Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 26, it's in verse 2. As the bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Remember when we obey, we're blessed. When we disobey, curses come. That's God's word. That's the judgment coming for disobedience. God is a just God. He's not going to just, you know, oh, I'll, obey, I'll bless you when you obey and, well, I'll kind of let it slide when you disobey. Oh, that's contrary to his word. That would be wrong. He can't do that. So the curse has always a cause for it. So we see the fact that this curse that had come on, you know, comes on people. There's always a cause for it, whether you realize it or not. Some people say, I wonder why these things are happening to me. Well, if it's something that God is bringing a judgment upon you, it's because of a cause. But there also can be time when I wonder what's happened to me. It seems like these attacks. I've been walking right and I get attacked on this. Well, that can be the devil. Because the devil can come at you because of a cause of sin. But he also can come and attack you whether there's any cause or not. He's going to go after you. Just like he wanted to go after, you know, Job. He's looking to go after him. Set his heart to get to him. So, remember that, that Satan will also work. Revelation, chap, Revelation chapter 12. 
through a cause if you sin, because Revelation 12.10 says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren. Who's that? The devil. What's he accusing us of? Of our sins, which does what? Gives him a right to be able to come at you. And until you would confess your sin and repent and close the door, he can get to you and you can't even stop it because of the open door of sin, which accused him before our God day and night. But Satan doesn't just operate, he doesn't operate according to God's word. He'll use that opportunity here, of course, to be able to have a right to go after you, but he'll attack you regardless. So the thing you have to realize is that if something's coming from a judgment from God, there's going to be a cause, which will be what's going to happen when the judgment's coming to the church. Those that aren't right, it'll be because of a cause. When the enemy is attacking, it could be because of a cause, because you, he's accused you and you've opened the door from sin, or he could just be attacking you because he wants to attack you and hinder you and try to bring destruction, whether there is any cause or not. He will try to come against you. And that's important to understand. In fact, we even see 1 Thessalonians 2. Here's an example of how he was hindering. 18. This is Paul saying to the Thessalon Thessalon uh, church at Thessalonica, Nica, he said, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Well, the enemy was hindering this. You know, he was trying to stop him. It wasn't what God wanted. Paul wasn't opening the door to the devil. It was the attacks of the enemy coming against him. So the enemy can try to hinder you and try to stop you. Let's go back to Job now. We saw, so we understand, verse 21, the Lord gave, the Lord taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord, truly stated, but not the truth. Not the truth. Don't believe that. Truly stated, but everything, who said it? Did God say it? No. Job said it, and it wasn't the truth. You've got to understand that. Some people just look at things, and they'll just take this, and they'll quote this like it's a true statement from God, when God didn't say it, and it isn't the truth whatsoever, which we know. And so he didn't sin, even though it was sin, in the sense that it wasn't the truth. But he didn't remember, he didn't know about this. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1, look here, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. We see the same scenario. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Has thou considered? Same word here. This is the word, Have you set the heart? Here's the word lab they have there first. It's got the word, there's the word sum, and next to it, you can, uh, the way the cursor works, that's the first word for set, and that's the word for lab, which is heart. Same thing. Have you set your heart against my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, perfect and upright man, one that fears God and chews evil, shews evil. He holds fast his integrity. Although thou movest me, this is talking about what Satan was doing to God. Moving, which means to try to incite, to instigate or entice God to bring a judgment against him. Against him. Now, why was that? Because the hedge was down, he knew he was in sin. But he wasn't going to fall for what Satan wanted. And notice what he says, although you're inciting me against him to destroy him without cause. That's the key. There was no cause for God to do it because law wasn't in force. So, that tells you something. The teaching that makes you think that, you know, these people say, well, the Lord was giving Satan permission and all these things. That's a lie. It wasn't true whatsoever. He was trying, it was the opposite. Satan was pressing God to try to have him bring judgment upon him. But God will not bring judgment without a cause. And then we come down to, he says here, put forth thine hand now, touch his bone, strike, same word. Strike his bone and his flesh and he'll curse thee to thy face. Before he destroyed all this property, all the things he had, his sheep and all the things he had. Now he's talking about coming against his body. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in thy hand to save his life. Now why was he in his hand? Because the hedge was down also, also about his physical health. He was in fear about all kinds of things. We know that. 
Because who went forth? Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils uh, from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And why he was, remember he said, the thing that I feared came unto me, and the thing that I greatly feared came upon me. Well, he was afraid of getting these kind of things. And that was the open door. And so, of course, his wife says, you're going to still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Give it up, you know. Throw in the towel. He's not about to do that, though. He rebukes her. He says to her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Again, thinking that I'm supposed to, God brings the good and he brings the evil, and I'm supposed to receive that from him. No. If there's a problem in life, we're supposed to confess our sin, repent, and turn from it, so we have his mercy. We're not supposed to sit there and receive good and then not be willing to accept evil. God, would, God always warns us and said, hey, repent. If you don't repent, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, of course, he doesn't want us to, quote, receive evil. He wants us to turn from sin. In all this, again, did Job not, not, not Job sin with his lips because, again, he did not have understanding of these things. Now, let's go over to Job chapter 3. And we see things that Job did that were not good. We need to make sure that we don't do those things. And we're going to look at and see a lot of the scriptures that come forth that show for a little bit here about the judgment that is going to come. In Job 3.1, after this opened, Job his mouth and cursed his day. Don't curse your day. Whatever kind of pressure might come against you, don't speak negative against your day. That's a mistake. He shouldn't have done that. He's ready to give it up and perish and all that stuff. We go on and we see, back, back in verse 3, Let the day perish when I was born, the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. Hmm. That's a male child, a strong man warrior that has been conceived. That has actually a double type to it. It's pointing towards Jesus, of course. He's the one. But from a standpoint of the type for the end time church, it's pointing about the strong warrior church man, the full man of the stature of Christ that's going to come forth in the last days. And that's exactly what's going to happen. We know this from over in Ephesians chapter 4. Tells you what the true apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is supposed to do for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, or to go on to perfection, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, that's going to be the mighty army of the Lord. The mighty man in Christ is going to arise. It's going to be mighty. Ah, well that's that mighty geber, as it says. That's the word in the Hebrew back on then. We go back over to Job, chapter 3, we're in verse 3. The strong man warrior, strength and ability to fight. That's what he's, he's making you and I. He's making you and I warriors so we can fight, so we can conquer. We're supposed to conquer in every situation. Remember, and when the judgment comes on the church that we talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, it talks about the things that were good, the things where they weren't right. It talked about the judgments that come if they didn't repent. And then at, all, at the end of each one of those ones, it says, he that conquers or overcomes, he that conquers and carries off the victory, which is what he's expecting all of us to do. You and I are to become the conquerors and to carry off the victory and overcome. So this is not only a type of Jesus, but also the strong, warrior, mighty church that is going to arise. Well, we see the day of the Lord being shown forth in many scriptures, and we're going to run through these and let you see this. These things, when you look at them, they're really pointing towards end time things. Let that day, this is that day when this war, the mighty warrior church arises 
because it's going to rise, see, in the midst of, the, let the day perish rise more, and the night in which it was said there's a man-child conceived. Because when there's darkness, the night covering the earth, at the same time, the mighty church is going to arise. We know that. I'll have to come back here for a moment again. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That's the mighty, glorious, end time, powerful church. What is going to be like in the world, though? For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. That's right. It's getting darker and darker. It's going to get worse. The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So at the time when there's the darkness, at the same time, the glorious church is going to arise. So as this man-child warrior is going to come forth, let that day be darkness, let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Darkness is going to be there at the same time. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. It's going to be a day of judgment. God is going to pour out his judgment on all those who are not walking right with him. The judgment comes to the church first, and then it comes to the world. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined under the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. This thick darkness <clears throat> is going to get upon it. This is a, a darkness that's going to engulf these ones. And why is it? Because they rejected, <clears throat> they rejected the way of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 7. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. When the judgments are coming, it's not going to be good for the world. They aren't going to have joy. They're going to be in trouble. They're going to be in torment. It is going to be a terrible time that is going to come. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up or rouse. It says they're mourning, but that's not what it says in the Hebrew because the word mourning is the word Leviathan. Who is Leviathan? The devil. Because who's going to be raised up or aroused? The devil. Why would that be? Because he has just been kicked out of heaven, come down to earth. We'll go back and show you that in Revelation. After the 6,000 years is done, and Jesus is now going to take back control over the earth. <clears throat> We see what's going to happen. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to clean house on all these evil spirits up in heaven and in the heavenlies. There was war in heaven, singular. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. They're going to be kicked out, and they're going to be kicked out of the heavenlies. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world or the, which means the inhabited earth. Not the word cosmo, the inhabited earth. He deceived everybody. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. That's when they all have come down and it's going to be havoc at that time. In fact, we come down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens. It's, you, the devils are gone. They've been cleaned out. And ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth though. And of the sea, but the devils come down with you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. That's right. He's only going to have a short time. The time of the reign of the Antichrist, for that's 1260 days, the 42 months, the time's time, and half a time. And he's going to be doing everything he can to try to bring destruction. Of course, deceiving the multitudes to accept the Antichrist and be deceived, of course. Joel 3, because he wants to wipe out everybody. He knows his judgment's coming. He wants to take everybody down, if possible. So, we come over here. Oops, not Joel, Job. Sorry there. Job 3, verse 8. The rising up of 
Leviathan. That's why Young's brings it out, ready to wake up Leviathan. The enemy is going to be come down because of what is going to be happening. The destruction is going to happen. The war is on. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light and have none. Neither let it see the dawn of the day. It's not going to be a time of light. It's going to be a time of darkness. It's going to cover the entire earth because of the evil that is going to happen. The new world order is going to come in. They're going to have control over the whole earth. And the Antichrist will come on the scene after, after remember, there's ten at first, and then three get wiped out. And out of, this, out of that, them rises the eighth, which is the Antichrist, who's going to begin to rule for the three and a half years. And the people are going to be so oppressed during this time. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Or why the breasts that I should suck? People are going to want to die during this time. It's going to get so much tremendous judgments that are going to be coming as the judgments begin to be poured out. Verse 21, which long for death, but it cometh not. They want to die, but they can't. Is that true? That's exactly what's going to happen in Revelation, we see. Look what it talks about when the judgments are being rolled out. Revelation 9, verse 6. In those days men will seek death and shall not find it. They want to die, but they can't. <laughs> Too bad, you're not going to die. The torment is going to happen. You're going to be, go through the judgment period. And shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. They won't be able to. We go back over to Job, chapter 3, as we saw here in verse 21. They're longing for death, but it's not going to happen whatsoever. And then we see, of course, these guys, just as Job was in fear, these guys are all going to be in fear, too, of what's happening. The thing which I greatly feared is going to come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. It's going to be a great time of havoc. Remember, it's more, the more pressure and the havoc is greater than the world has ever seen during this time. That's why we got to be right. The ones that are right can be protected. The ones that aren't right are going to be in trouble. They're going to get hit. Job 4, verse 8. Even as I've seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Oh, they're not going to get away with it. Nobody's going to get away with anything. If they haven't repented and got right with from the Lord, they're going to be trouble. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. This is God's judgment coming. And then it says, the roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. Now this tells you that God... Not only is he bringing judgment on the people, but he's also, he will destroy these nations. Because remember, the nations are going to rise up and have their one world order. But they're going to get judged. The judgment is going to come upon them. This roaring of the lion, voice of the fierce lion, and teeth of the young lions, that's speaking of these nations that are ruling at that time. How do we know? Because it's in Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. Look what it says. The first beast was like a lion. So it's talking about one of these ones that's like a lion, a, a beast here. A lion. And there's all these different ones that we see talking about a lion. We talk about in chapter 9, verse 8. Here's where it talks about the judgments. They had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. The teeth of lions. And we see in Revelation 13, talking about how the Antichrist is going to be, he rises up. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth was the mouth of a lion, speaking things. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Well, what's going to happen? The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lions, they're going to be broken. Because the judgment is going to come on these nations and they're not going to get away with carrying out their destruction. While they're ruling and making havoc for the whole world, judgment's going to be coming upon them. They're going to see much destruction coming. We also see 
down here in chapter 9, there is going to be tremendous havoc coming along. And Job talks about it. Which removeth mountains, and they know not, which overturn them in his anger. Hmm, that's like earthquakes or mountains in his anger. That's the anger of the Lord bringing judgments upon him. Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. There's going to be tremendous earthquakes, remember, and <laughs> tremendous shaking that's going to go on, and it's going to affect the nations. If you're right with the Lord, you'll be fine. If you're not right with the Lord, you'll be in trouble. That's for sure. He commands the sun and rises not, seals up the stars. It's going to be tremendous things. There'll be signs in the heavens, remember, as well as in the earth. All those things are going to happen. It speaks of all those things. We come to verse 12. Behold, he taketh away who can hinder him. Who will say to him, what doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. Huh, no. He's going to bring forth his judgment. It's a righteous anger based on the fact that these ones have rejected him and they have it's actually been vessels of the devil. They're on the devil's camp, of course. The nations have given over unto them. We come to verse 24. Look at the statements made. The earth is given in the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? The earth has been given in the hands of the wicked. Not only was it done, of course, when he gave a hand to Satan, but this is talking about the wicked, all these wicked ones. That's what's going to happen as we see this new world order arises. And we're going to see the destruction. At the same time, Job talks about how there has to be a total a judgment, but also there had to be a cleansing in the heavens. Why? Job 15, 15. Behold, he puts no trust in his saints, yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Why weren't they clean? Because Satan was up there. He's polluted the whole thing. That's why everything has to be cleansed. In fact, at the end of everything, that's why there has to be a new heavens and a new earth. I mean, there's got to be everything perfect and brand new, and there will be because they have been polluted. Of course, this is also why Jesus had to go up there and he had to pour out his blood in the mercy seat in heaven to cleanse the heavenly utensils it talks about. He had to get things cleansed because of the evil. And of course, why is man in the shape he's in if he hasn't gotten right with God? Verse 16, how much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? <laughs> he's taking it in like he's drinking water. All these judgments are going to come upon him. Verse 21, a dreadful sound in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. Now, that's destroyer. That's the devil's attacks. Going to take away the prosperity. People's prosperity won't stay that are not right. He believeth not that he shall return out of darkness. He's waited for of the sword. <laughs> Otherwise, the destruction of the sword is going to come against him. He wandereth abroad for bread, saying, Where is it? It means he doesn't, it's famine time. He doesn't have any food. He knows that the day of darkness is ready to his hand. Trouble. Trouble and anguish shall make him afraid. They shall prevail against him as a king ready to the battle. These are all things that are going to happen for all those that are not right with God. He stretches out his hand against God. Oh, they'll fight against God. They won't repent, and Revelation talks about how they won't repent, and they fight against them. They're mad about it. They're raging. The heathen are raging. And strengthen himself against the Almighty. <laughs> well, that's not going to do any good for him, of course. They're going to get taken out. He shall not depart out of darkness. The flame shall dry up his branches, and that's the judgment that's going to come. And by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. People that won't repent, go away from darkness, they're going to be in trouble. And the hypocrites in the church, they're, big, they're in real trouble. Look what it says about them. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate. Ah, they're going to get destroyed. And fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. <laughs> ah, the ones that haven't been doing things right. And there's problems. That's all the judgments are going to come. We see over in Job chapter 20, more judgments. Verse 23. 
When he's about to fill his belly, God shall cast the fury of his wrath upon him and shall rain it upon him while he's eaten. That's going to be terrible for the nations. Remember, people just think there's a terrible time for the church. It's going to be terrible for the nations. The people out there, this is judgment upon the nations that's going to come very severely. Verse 27. The heaven shall reveal his iniquity. The earth shall rise up against him. There's, heaven reveals iniquity. It's all seeing all the evil things, and the earth is not going to want to repent. They're going to instead rise up against him. Well, that sure is a mistake. That's not going to get him anywhere. Well, the increase of his house is going to depart, and his goods are going to flow away on the day of his wrath. He's going to lose everything. That's what's going to happen to the world. It's going to be a time of havoc. Remember, they want to die because they can't take what's going on, and they can't die. This is a time of tremendous judgment that comes. People have not realized the severity of the judgment that God is going to bring. This is the portion of the wicked man from God and the heritage appointed unto him by God. That's right. They're in trouble. Chapter 21, verse 13. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Oh, all these people are keeping all their riches, you know, and all that stuff. And they think they're all okay. Oh, they're out there building their bunkers under the mountains and all these things. <laughs> they're not going to do them a bit of good. It's all going to go. And therefore they say to God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. We don't want to know about you. <laughs> That's what they've been doing. Well, they're going to get taken down. What's the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit shall we have we pray unto him? Anybody that has these attitudes, they are going to see absolute destruction come. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? How often cometh their destruction upon him? God distributed sorrows in his anger. It's going to be multiplied destruction, and sorrows are going to come. There is stubble before the wind, and is chaff that the storm carries away. Verse 19, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth them, and he shall know it. Well, those are the ones that are going to see the judgment, because they're not right. His eyes shall see his destruction. He shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. This is tremendous wrath that's going to come. It's astounding. Verse 30, the wicked is reserved to this day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. I mean, this just isn't wait, waiting for the end when there's just one big battle at Armageddon. That's what some people's mindset has been. No, it's an ongoing destruction that's going to happen as these judgments are rolled out. And it is going to be very severe. They're not going to have any chance of getting away. That's why you, got not, you and I must walk right. We must be holy before God. We must also know that God will protect us and deliver us and keep us safe and throughout all the things that are going on. Remember when the judgments were coming and rolled, being rolled out on Egypt? The, the people of God, the, which are the Jews at that time, were in Goshen. And even when the calamities were hitting them, it didn't even touch them. There weren't any calamities hitting them. They were protected. The people of God will be protected if they're walking right. For his eyes are upon the ways of man and sees all his goings. There's no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. They can't hide. Nobody can hide. Everybody is going to be taken down by their iniquity. He shall break in pieces the mighty men without number and set others in their stead. All these mighty ones are going to come down. They're going to be in trouble. He knows their works and overturns them in the night so that they are destroyed. Man can try to do anything he can to think he's going to escape the judgment. It won't work. He strikes them as wicked men in the open sight of others. Tremendous attacks and judgments are going to come. And one last scripture before we close for tonight. This is a scripture with people, we sing the song, but they haven't understood this song or the scripture about what the song is. About the Redeemer lives. For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's right. 
Remember, he came the first time to bring salvation, accomplish the redemption, which he did. But this is talking about him coming the second time, because he's coming. And he that shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And this word means, because it's the him coming to bring the judgment, remember he came as a lamb at first, now he's coming as a lion. This means, as the word, actually means to arise in a hostile sense. He's going to rise in a hostile sense at the latter day upon the earth, and he is going to bring the devastation and destruction to the nations, and then he's going to establish the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. In fact, the devastation is going to be so severe, they're wanting, all the islands are going to be moved out. They're not even going to be around, and all the mountains are going to come down. The topography will look totally different because it will all be wiped out. But Jesus will come and he's going to reign from Jerusalem. But this is righteous judgment. And we need to see this because we need to understand what's coming. So you're not moved. And also, as long as you're right, you won't be affected by any of this. But it's going to come. These people, the evil people, are going to rise and be stronger, more violent as we go down these days. You have to walk in love and pray for them to come to repentance. Don't think that they're going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. <laughs> All their iniquity is going to be revealed and the judgments will come on every single one. And they'll be severe. All these guys that are doing the things they're doing now, all the ones who have been the money masters of this world, who've been controlling all these different things and can cause a lot of these wars and contribute, they contribute to both sides to cause the wars to further their, their, their new world order agenda. These guys are really going to be taken down with tremendous judgments that are going to come. But this is God's righteous judgment. It's revealed here in Job. But we got one more time to get together, which will be about this on Wednesday night. And we're going to be talking about how the remnant church will be protected and what the remnant church is going to do, all the things it says in Job that we're to do, and how we'll be protected. And we'll be talking about that on Wednesday night. Say this to me. Say, Heavenly Father. I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the end time prophetic workings through Job. I thank you that I see that Job the hated one is a type of the church who is hated by the world, hated by the devil, an ungodly people. And I thank you that Job is a type of the remnant church the glorious church, the perfected church, who is perfected without spot, without wrinkle, is holy before you, is walking in the fear of the Lord, is upright before you, and turned away from all evil, and walking in your ways, in righteousness. I also understand those that are not right, they're going to be judged. Because judgment will come, the wrath of God be revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. I will make sure I am walking in the way of the Lord 100% and going on to perfection, seeing God accomplish His total work in my life. So I will be protected. I thank you, Lord. That as I see what the Word says of the tremendous judgments that are going to come upon the world, I will not be surprised. I will not be overwhelmed. I will not be in fear. I understand it's going to happen. And it's God's judgments that are righteous that are going to happen. But I thank you, Lord. You will protect me and keep me because I will be right before you. I thank you for your word that shows forth the work of Jesus, bringing forth these end time judgments. And as he comes in the latter day, he will arise powerfully, the lion of the tribe of Judah, bringing the judgments as he takes back the authority over the earth and establishes the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I thank you that I will be a part of that remnant church 
that will be with the Lord in the millennial reign, ruling and reigning for a thousand years, and then be with the Father in the new heavens and the new earth in the eternal age. I thank you, Lord. I am following you 100%. None of these judgments are going to be coming on me because I'm going to be walking right. And I'm going to pray for others and witness to them and encourage them and exhort them and command them to get right because of what will happen if they reject the word. Thank you, Lord, for using me to reach people with the gospel and to come to true repentance. Thank you, Lord, for your word. So I'll understand, I'll be prepared, and I'll make sure I'm walking right with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Not only does this show us what's coming, this makes sure I'm going to make sure I am right. No way am I going to be in a position to get hit with all this stuff. No, we're going to walk right before him. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We have ears to hear. We'll be doers of your word. We understand the revelation of the judgments that are coming and the attacks of the enemy, but we know that we can overcome, just like the one said, I only are the one who has escaped. We can escape every attack of the enemy. We can escape everything that will come against us, and we will be protected. Thank you, Father, for the great, mighty, perfected, remnant, glorious church being raised up in this day and hour, which we're going to be a part as we walk in your ways. Thank you for all the great things that you're accomplishing and will continue to accomplish as we walk in your ways to be a part of that end time church. Thank you, Father, for much fruit because we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.